thank you, sir. And dear friends, I'm uh, especially thankful to GRFDT for uh, giving me an opportunity to present my paper in front of such a, such an interesting and uh, and uh, impressive audience. Uh, friends, the title of my paper is Hindu Nationalism, Identity and Marginalization in Indian Diasporic Literature in the U.S. The Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965, by eliminating national origins quotas, opened the door to a select, to a select but significant number of Asian Indian immigrants to make the first step in becoming U.S. citizens. Prior to 1965, it is estimated that Indian immigrants to the United States numbered less than 15,000. In 1980, census listed 3,87,223 Asian Indians as permanent residents. And in 1990 census, the number reached 81,5219. In 2000, in the 2000 U.S. Census, this number climbed to 16,78,765 and according to the 2010 Census, the figure expanded to 28,48,391. Indians are amongst the fastest growing ethnic groups in the country and wield a disproportionate influence since they are among the wealthiest and the most educated foreign-born groups in this country, having a median income of 61322 which is uh, $22, which is almost double the median income of all American families. 200,000 Indian Americans are millionaires. More than 35,000 are physicians. 300,000 work in our high-tech industries. 58,000 of the community over the age of 25 have a college degree. 43.6% of the Indian Americans in the workforce are employed as managers or professionals. 15% of the Silicon Valley startup firms are owned by Indian Americans. More than 5,000 Indian Americans are in the faculties of various American universities. 74,603 Indians are studying in the United States making Indians the largest group of foreign students in the country. The 2000 census reports that the unemployment rate of the Indian American community with 1.75% is lower than the unemployment rate of the general population with 1.93%. Indians are not behind in carrying with them their food, music and literature to the American shores. Today, one is likely to find vegetarian foods and Indian spices in most large American grocery stores. Music has empowered diaspora groups by staking into a unique cultural space in the host nation, providing a voice for the marginalized community. Among young Indian Americans, Desi music is used not only to cross the distance to India, but to create an entirely new space one that asserts and affirms both aspects of their hyphenated identities. In Chicago, for instance, they say music takes a form which not only expresses diasporic Indian American identity, but local in indo chicagoan identity. Many Asian Indian writers have produced a good work dealing with their migration to foreign land and the experience of being away from home. The works also reflect their various efforts to adapt to the new environment by preserving their own identity. Let's have a look how, uh, how, how Hinduism traveled to US, as this paper focuses especially on the Hindu diaspora. Although there is no official figure on the religious distribution of Indians in the United States, the estimated Hindu population in the US is now 9,930,000. 9, or we can say that about half of the Indian diaspora in the U.S. comprises of Hindus. While the arrival of Indian immigrants to the U.S. after the passage of the Immigration Act of 1965 significantly hastened the growth of Hinduism, these were not the first to cultivate the seeds of Hinduism on American soil. The history of Hinduism in America began long before any guru or teacher came to these stores. 
shores. Sorry. During the 17th uh, century, missionaries and members of the British government working in India had many sacred texts translated into Sanskrit, translated, uh, translated from Sanskrit into English. These books made their way to America. The Bhagavad Gita became a favorite text of the noted American transcendentalists, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Margaret Fuller, and Henry David Thoreau. The writings of Emerson and Thoreau created a climate of interest and familiarity with strands of Hindu thought from Swami Vivekananda, who arrived in the U.S. in 1893 to speak at the World's Parliament of Religions, held in conjunction with the Chicago World's Fair. Vivekananda's impact on the Parliament was memorable, and it was followed by two years of intense lecturing along the eastern and the western ports of the U.S., and also in cities like Minneapolis, Des Moines, Detroit, and Memphis. He established branches of the Americas, first in the organization, the Vedanta Society in New York in 1894 and San Francisco in 1899. Still earlier, the impact of Hindu ideas came through the efforts of an Indian guru named Ram Mohan Roy. He started a group called Brahma Samaj to transmit to Indians his thoughts about the Upanishads. Roy taught that the highest form of spirituality should be understood without the many colorful deities in other Hindu writings. Roy's first book, The Precepts of Jesus, was brought to the United States in 1825. The ideas in the book found some acceptance with the early Unitarians, Unitarians in America who believed that God should be worshipped alone and not as a trinity, trinity divided, as, divided into the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, as many Christian denominations did. The Unitarians The Unitarians and the Brahma Samaj developed close bonds that they continue to share even today. Hindu immigration to America has added another diverse and interesting dimension to the busy world of religion in America. As the number of followers in Hinduism increased, they built temples dedicated to Shiva, Vishnu and the numerous other gods who are held in high regard. The temples serve as central locations where Hindus can come together to worship during holy festivals and socialize with other Hindus. Temples in America reflect the colorful kaleidoscope, kaleidoscopic aspects contained in Hinduism while unifying people who are dispersed throughout the American landscape. Today, with over 700 temples and centers, Hinduism has become a visible part of America's religious mosaic. The past 30 years have seen the rise of temple-based Hinduism in the United States which is something very new to American culture. Starting with a makeshift Hindu temple in Sunnyvale and purchasing a former church at the corner of Polk and Mine in Minneapolis, which now houses Hindu community of the Twin Cities, the Hindus have gone much beyond this adapted, adaptive use and have initiated the building of brand new temples, like the one in Liverpool, as they have put down roots in the American landscape. The Hindu, the, temp, the, the temple Hinduism of the new immigration has brought the Hindu gods permanently to America, beginning with the first full-scale Hindu temples dedicated in 1978. That year, on the hilltop outside Pittsburgh, the Sri Venkateshwar Temple and Lord Vishnu was consecrated and in Flushing, Queens, a landmark temple of Lord Ganesha was opened. Today, with over 700 Hindu temples across the country, New York houses the largest number, have, n number having Iskwan Temple at Long Island, Shirdi Sai Baba Temple in Flushing, Vaishnava Temple and Rameshwaran Temple, and Divya Dham Temple in Queens is one of the biggest Hindu temples in the U.S. The development of Hinduism on American soil cannot be studied in isolation at, as it is very much associated with various social cultural experiences the Hindu migrants have undergone. Hindus who represent the, uh, the largest religious group in India at almost 83% of the population also make up the largest group of Asian Indian immigrants to the United States. Religions do not constitute diaspora themselves, but they provide additional cement to bind a diasporic consciousness. A religion plays a central role in identity development as immigrants deal with elements of cultural change and serve as a vehicle for cultural trans transmission. 
it is possible to talk of a Hindu diaspora, especially because no matter where in the world they live, most Hindus tend to secularize India and therefore have a special kind of relationship to a spiritual homeland. Issues of religious and cultural reproduction naturally raise questions concerning the maintenance, modification or discarding of religious practices among the subsequent generations born and raised in post-migration settings. Every day, religious and cultural practices, religious nurture at home, religious education at school, and participation at formal places of worship all shape the identities and activities of the subsequent generations. Diasporic identifications may be multiple too, depending on the criteria used. The same individual may consider himself or herself to be a part of a Hindu global population, or a dispersed community of Sma Swami Narayans, that is a sect, Indians, that is a nation or state, Gujaratis, that is state or language, Patidas or Patels as caste and subcaste, Suratis as dialect and region or villages. These do not rule out, rule each other out. However, moreover, any one of a person's identities may be dormant or active, transnational. Caste is increasingly an aspect of culture rather than of social stratification and these caste identities are strong within the Hindu diaspora which restrict the interaction pattern of non-Dalits with the Dalit diaspora. Caste does not in fact play any, play any significant role in the everyday diaspora but when a family begins to investigate marriage, caste restrictions become palpable, thus dissipating the vestiges of conservative Hindu tradition in the second generation youth. Multiculturalism in the U.S. encourages the development of a strategy of selective acculturation, whereby groups use a celebratory model, minority discourse of ethnic pride, to maintain aspects of their ethnic culture. However, it also encourages the development of a reactive ethnicity based on an adversarial, oppressed minority discourse of ethnic victimization, and this potent com combination has often tended to strengthen diasporic nationalism among immigrants. Throughout the past few decades, much blood has been split in the name of the so-called Hindu nationalism, all for the purpose of uniting a land that in truth have never been united, and it is believed that the rise of Hindu, nas Hindu nationalist politics has been funded and supported by Hindu diaspora groups. In fact, it is through diaspora that one can interact nationalism, and this certainly is tied to changes in technology, communication and community associated with globalization and has certainly taken shape in the conceptual correspondences made between religion and nation. Hindutva movements have been able to negotiate the relationship of diasporic subjects to their homeland through really nationalistic religious stories of prevalence and preservation taking shape in worldwide organization of Vishwa Hindu Parishad and Rashtriya Swayam Sam and has relied extensively on its followers in the US, Britain, Canada, and Europe to, general, to generate global support and funds for its political ventures in India. The Hindu diaspora, as generally understood and propagated, is not a monolithic identity, and the overlapping identities, and the overlapping multiple identities are blanketed under the term Hindu identity with the intention of creating the Hindu nation. This assertion of Hindu identity is itself a process of intolerance towards other religions like Christianity and Islam, and also reflect the marginalization of various socio-cultural aspects within the Hindu fold. The rituals, the food habits, the marriage patterns, the music, the literature varies with locations, <coughs> sects and castes within the hierarchical Hindu society, but these, cult but these crucial elements are neglected or deliberately avoided in order to create a single Hindu identity. The different marginalized communities are very critical to dominant Hindu nationalism in India and the US and are seeking their active representation in it by rewriting their own interpretation of history. These communities such as Dalits, women, etc. are struggling for their recognition through literature, art and films. There are many movements of these marginalized groups with a Hindu identity or even out of it, like conversion to other religions like Islam, Christianity, Sikhism and Buddhism. There are identity clashes between the older diaspora and the new diaspora and a major domain of intra-ethnic conflict today among the Indian diaspora is religion, which in the name of Operation Blue Star 
for instance, has left its scars on the Hindu and Sikh communities outside India. For the, from the perspective of the Indian government, the diaspora's attention can also focus on issues that are embarrassing or threatening to the government in New Delhi. The move to place caste as a form of racial oppression on the United Nations agenda and the international conference of Dalit groups are examples of the diaspora working against the prevailing power structure in India. The U.S. is becoming the hub of activities of the Dalit diaspora. A more organized effort came to the U.S. from, NR, from literate NRI Dalits when they formed volunteers in service to India's oppressed and neglected vision in 1975. The organization has organized conferences in the U.S. To sensitize, to sensitize people about the wicked conditions of the Dalits back home and about the role of VHP, which collects funds from abroad in the name of Hindus. Dalits have also donated unknowingly, but now they have stopped donations to VHP, and now it is making an effort to wean away Dalits from the VHP. Dalits in the U.S. celebrate and commemorate Ambedkar's, Buddha's, and Ravidas's birthday and death anniversaries, death anniversaries respectively, with a lot of fanfare. In fact, they aligned with the Black Panther movement in the U.S. and highlighted their flight, which became the symbol of Dalit and Black unity. Now, let's have a look on the Indian diasporic writings. The construction of social identities and the meanings associated with them is a cognitive and sense-making process. The diasporic production of cultural meanings occur, occurs, occur in many areas such as contemporary music, film, theatre and dance. But writing is one of the most interesting and strategic ways in which diaspora might disrupt the binary of local and global and problematize national, racial and ethnic formulations of identity. The contribution of the Indian diaspora in Indian writing in English is not new, and it is interesting to note that the history of diasporic Indian writing is as old as the diaspora itself. The Indian diaspora has become a part of the American and English literary tradition. The writers like Anita Desai, Bharti Mukherjee, Shashi Tharoor, Amitabh Ghosh, Vikram Seth, Sunet Ragupta, Jhumpa Lahiri, and Hari Kunjru have all made their names while residing abroad and explored their sense of displacement a perennial theme in all their works, giving birth to the sense of displacement and ruthlessness. Instead of worshipping the leftovers and relics of a now inaccessible homeland as the, as the old diaspora of endangered laborers did, the new diaspora of international Indian English writers live close to their market in the comforts of the suburbia of advanced capital but draw their raw material from the inexhaustible imaginative resources of that messy and disorderly subcontinent that is India and record their away from India experiences often in an elegiac tone rather than with nostalgia. Ultimately, increasingly identifying themselves with the, with the literary tradition of the migrant writers of the world. Indians don't have a common history, especially of suffering, that binds them and they have loyalties to a place and its cultural environs, which is not adequate to create that cohesion behind a world of literary art. Instead of cultures, the great Indian writers write about experience of their subculture, which preclude a larger Indian audience from appreciating the literature. Thus, the local authors overpower potential national authors in India, and that trend is exported to America. While the earlier non uh, by the earlier Hindu Anglian writings like those by the overly socialist author Mulk Raj Anand in his Untouchable 1935 and Cooley in 1936 and by Kamla Markande in her Nectar in a Side 1954 and a handful of rice 1966 deal sympathetically and fairly with the lower caste and class non-English speaking segments of Indian society the works produced by Indian writers in the U.S. in recent times reveal a clear bias in favor of classical, Brahminic, and therefore exclusionary intended to produce an effect of a pure Indianness, with little attention to its class and caste-based social, communal, and religious inequalities. Emmanuel S. Nelson's two edited books, Rewording the Literature of the Indian Diaspora and the Writers of and the writers of the Indian diaspora, a bio-bibliographical source, critical source book, firmly establish the literary contours of Indian diasporic writings. The strength of the two books lies in their refusal to homogenize 
the experiences and histories of various groups of diasporic Indians, even as they attempt to bring the literary work produced in these circumstances under the rubric of literature of Indian diaspora. And I would conclude with, most writings on diaspora today are in fact marginalized the factor of religion and relegated it to the second place in favor of ethnicity and nationality. But as new nations are constituted daily, it is becoming increasingly difficult to locate the nation in, na in national literatures. Thus, the literature produced out of dias diasporic experiences has always, has always been in the business of constructing fictions that fit realities that, they, that don't fit realities. This is possible because big issues like religious intolerance and racial discrimination are no longer the main concern of these titles.